Great. So the first talk, if we can get the slides up, I'm going to just frame the session on how modern DBT intervention actually has clear clinical guidance uh, based on the pivotal clinical trials that have been conducted over the last 10 to 15 years. These are my disclosures. And really, all of these are based on the open vein hypothesis, the idea that residual thrombus is associated with poor long-term outcomes and resulting in the post-thrombotic syndrome. Uh, the Gavent study clearly showed that there was a significant inverse correlation between post-lysis thrombus score and patency in the femoral and iliofemoral DVT after 24 months. Um, really, the ATTRACT trial is the center of modern DVT conversation. Even though it was published in 2017, we've seen a steady stream of the subset analysis that has come out of the ATTRACT, and I think really the devil is in the details, and it shows that there are a clear subset of patients that benefit from intervention. As a reminder to those of you that don't, don't know or don't remember, this is an NIH-sponsored phase three multicenter randomized open-label assessor-blinded trial, and assessor-blinding is a clear... Uh, of clear value because it removes the bias, it shows us the, it cuts to the clinical truth of which patients really need to be treated. This is pharmacomechanical therapy and standard therapy versus standard therapy alone, meaning just anticoagulation, and enrolled nearly 700 patients. There was a combined primary endpoint of all proximal DBT, and this has been leveled as a criticism against a track, but we have to remember that this study was first designed in 2008, and when the federal government gives you over $15 million to conduct a trial, they want all the answers, so you have to combine FEMPOP and iliofemoral DVT. They found, of course, the byline in the New England Journal of Medicine was that there was no difference in PTS incidence or general or venous QOL between the treatment arms and the control arms, and there was a higher major bleeding rate in the pharmacomechanical arm. But the interesting thing to point out here is, unlike other lytic trials, say you're talking about PE and Pytho, for example, where there was clear mortality, intracranial hemorrhage, all of those things. In nearly 350 randomized patients, no one died, no one bled in their head, and they got lysed. So maybe lytics aren't quite as dangerous as once was posited. Um, if we dive down a little bit further, this is the iliofemoral cohort of tract, 391 patients. They found decreased moderate to severe PTS in the treatment arm, uh, a 10% risk reduction, and decreased severe PTS from 15% to 8.7%. And we'll talk about what, what constitutes moderate to severe PTS and severe PTS. And they found an improvement in venous-specific uh, QOL. So the take-home from this subset analysis of the trial is that there was an apparent benefit in patients with moderate to severe symptoms at presentation, meaning you treat those with iliofemoral DVT. Looking at patients with iliofemoral DBT a little bit further, this was 381 patients from that subset, and they looked at uh, baseline factors correlated with venous clinical outcomes at 24 months. And what they found was that if you had a Volalta score, and remembering that Volalta is a post-thrombotic instrument, not a DVT instrument, but there is no DVT instrument that exists, they found that if you applied the Volalta score to a uh, uh, de novo iliofemoral DVT in the ER and they had a score of 10 or greater, they found a one-third reduction in moderate to severe PTS in the pharmacomechanical arm. And unlike pretty much anything in vascular disease, at some point you get an effect drop off, meaning that they're so severe that they literally aren't gonna benefit. There's no way you're gonna help that patient. And you can see from this that the worse they got, the more magnified the effect. And this is a profound finding. Uh, it shows that from prospective validation that you can not only use the Volalta scale to assess DVT patients, but you can also clearly improve patients as the severity gets worse, basically up until venous gangrene. And I'll ask my colleagues here on the panel, before this, how, how would you talk about a DVT patient in an objective way? If you're trying to re relate to a colleague that I have a, pa a DVT patient that has really bad symptoms, there was a number you could put to it. Am I correct? I mean, they would just say, yeah, it's a really bad DVT. And, that's an imprecise and, frankly, untechnical way to talk about it. So this is, this is really important data. Also important, knowing who not to treat. This is 300 patients from the FEMPOP cohort of the ATTRACT uh, trial. They found no difference in moderate to severe PTS, no difference in venous-specific QOL, and they had three major bleeds in the pharmacomechanical arm. So really, most patients with femoral popliteal DVT, isolated, below the profunda alone, really shouldn't be treated. I don't treat them. I hear all the time that my patients get better. Remember, this is assessor blinding. You have patients, or you have people that don't know what the patient got, and out of that they say, yeah, there really isn't clear benefit to these patients. You're just exposing them to risk. Are there nuances? Do patients get pop occlusive PTS? Absolutely. I have patients that have really bad pop occlusive PTS. Maybe they would have benefited, but how do you parse those patients out when they're coming in? There's no clear way to do it yet. So, 
Our perspective, should pharmacomechanical therapy be the first-line treatment in all proximal DBT? No, it really shouldn't. We should be in uh, iliofemoral DBT patients with at least moderate to severe symptoms of volatile of 10 or greater and not routinely t treating femoral popliteal DBT. But the world is different. We've moved to less lytic, mechanical-only de devices, moving to single-session treatment. But and, and though mechanical thrombectomy is efficient, it is uniquely operator-dependent, which means there's a possible differences in outcome, possible difference in safety, and even though uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis is less efficient, it carries bleeding risk, but is more reproducible, meaning if there's a set protocol, you can actually get the same results no matter where you go but that's not clinical reality. So just show a case here. This is a patient with iliofemoral DBT that extended into the vena cava. This would not have been the attract trial because of a significant extension into the IVC. And you can see on the, on the run images that there's not only thrombus in the femoral vein extending into the iliofemoral segment, but also into the IVC as well here. And in this case, we performed mechanical thrombectomy use, utilizing a, the penumbra catheter and placed a stent and we're able to clear everything out. And this is a patient that clearly benefits. Young patient, very significant symptoms, and uh, benefited from on-table treatment and placement of a stent. There are single-arm multicenter registries and IDE trials underway. Under full disclosure, I was in two of these. The Clear DVT was a small cohort of six expert centers that put out roughly 37 patients and showed virtually no PTS uh, with the usage of angiojet pharmacomechanical thrombectomy. Um, I am the national principal, one of two national principal investigators of the BOLT trial, um, which is currently enrolling iliofemoral only patients. CLOT was real world, meaning they also uh, enrolled femoral popliteal patients. And these will provide insight on device efficacy and procedure outcomes. But remember, there's no comparator arm. You have nothing you're comparing against. So you're just going to be talking about how safe is this isolated within this group of people. And there's at least one industry-sponsored RCT on the way. What about the timing of intervention? Attract says up to 14 days, Covent treated up to 21 days, but these are, these are arbitrary numbers. Patients organize at different rates, probably because clot organization into collagen, there's no such thing as chronic DVT, it's type three, type one collagen, is an immune-mediated response, meaning young patients organize faster than younger uh, than than older patients. And if you look at this right here, and you know people like to show like, oh, look at these strings of collagen wrote. If you actually open a vein, and yeah, I talk to my surgical colleagues that do endophlebectomy, that's what you see. You see collagen. Collagen is not thrombus. Collagen is collagen. It's connective tissue. It cannot be easily removed. If it can be removed, the question is, what are you doing for the patient? Do they still need a stent? And now I would argue. If they need a stent, that's a post-thrombotic obstruction, just place a stent. Why are you exposing them to um, potentially unnecessary risk of thrombectomy? But in these patients, where you have subacute, not wall-organized, non-cicatrized vessels, and a clearly acute thrombus, there's clear benefit in patients with iliofemoral DBT. So to sum up, we need to select patients that have been shown to have clear benefit. Iliofemoral DVT, significant symptoms of presentation, usually of a lot of 10 or more. We need to work on a specific acute DVT instrument and within a short period of time from onset. And that's arbitrary. I, I would agree with that. 14 days may not be the right thing, but you know, use your best judgment. Use the wire test. If the wire is not going easily through, it's probably not going to come out with a thrombectomy device. Plenty of devices to choose some. There's no strong data to demonstrate superiority over, from one over another. There's many devices on the way. We'll be talking about a few of them um, uh, in, in, in a talk later on in the session. Be familiar with the strengths and weaknesses of a particular device. And really, the greater experience you have with the device, the more likely you are to have positive outcomes. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hernane to talk about AngioJet for acute DVT.